Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for attending Ticks on the Move. This is the 15th in the Center for Environmental Inquiry at Sonoma State University's Fall Dig into Nature series of 20 virtual environmental education events. My name is Margot Rollins, and I am a program coordinator with the Center. Until COVID-19 hit us, our public events such as these were held at one of our preserves, either the Osborne Preserve on Sonoma Mountain and Pengrove, or the Galbraith Wildlands Preserve in Southern Mendocino County. While we miss having people on the preserves, the Zoom format has allowed us to reach a larger, broader audience. We would usually pass around a sign-in sheet, but in lieu of that, may I ask everyone to please take a minute and put your name into the chat box for us so that we know who's actually here. Before I let our presenter take it away, I want to tell you just a little bit about the center and how we can be a resource to you, no matter whether you have an affiliation or any kind of connection with the university or not. You might be a, a student, a parent, a professor, government employee, educator in general, a member of the public, or perhaps you work for an organization in search of an environmental solution. Well, the center envisions a North Bay working together to find sustainable solutions and we invite you to get environmentally ready with us. We're building a community of learners and problem solvers across all sectors of society by providing enhanced understanding of our connection with our environment and skill building experiences that lead towards sustainable solutions. There are many ways you can get involved with us. You can engage in research. You can participate in some of our naturalist training programs, attend events like these or lead events like these access the robust data that is on our website, partner with us. There are many ways to be involved and we would be happy to talk to you about any thoughts you might have because each of you is a critical element as we work together to address the greatest environmental challenges in history. But today we're gonna to talk about ticks, those voracious troubling little insects found all over California. Our leader is Dr. Emily Pasco. Emily is a research fellow in the Department of Medicine and Epidemiology at the School of Veterinary Medicine at UC Davis. Her research focuses on the ecology of ticks and the pathogens that they transmit. She will be presenting in what we call a deep dive format. There will be about 40 minutes of presentation and then we will have a 10 to 15 minute question and answer series. The formal program will end at a three, but Emily and I will stay on Zoom in case she's not been able to answer all of your questions. I have muted you all and turned off your videos. So if you have any issues such as you can't hear us, uh, please put them into the chat box, which somebody will be monitoring and, and bring that to our attention. If you have clarifying questions or you're confused about something Emily says, feel free to put those in the chat box too and I will relay them to her as she, in the middle of our presentation. Otherwise, Enter them as they occur to you, and I will present them to Emily at the end during the question and answer period. The session is being recorded and it will be posted on our website, cei.sonoma.edu forward slash calendar forward slash past events in about a week's time. I will be letting you know via email when they are up. Emily, please, we look forward to hearing from you. So I'm Emily, as Margot very kindly introduced me, and I work at the University of California, Davis, which is on Patwin land, and I work for the Pacific Southwest Center of Excellence in Vector-Borne Diseases. And I saw from the registration that you um, all come from very different um, interests and probably background knowledge, so I've tried to include a variety of different information in this pro uh, presentation. But if there is anything you'd like to learn more about or you're unsure of or you want to hear more about my research, feel free to email me at the end. Firstly, what is a tick? Well, a lot of people mistakenly call them insects when they're actually more related to mites and spiders. They're obligate parasites, which means they must take a blood meal in order to survive and develop. And they're really well adapted to doing this. They have enzymes and other proteins in their saliva that has vasodilatory and anticoagulation properties, which make them very efficient at taking a blood meal. There are both soft and hard ticks and they belong in different taxonomic groups and they have different, um, very different life cycles. And I will talk a little bit more about soft ticks later, but the majority of this talk is going to be on hard ticks. 
A few more tick facts. So there are hundreds of different species and they each have very different ecologies and host preferences and behaviors. And, some, and also they appear very different as well. And some of them can be quite pretty in my opinion. For example, these amblyomic Cajun ants have really pretty almost iridescent markings on their scutums. They cannot jump or fly as many people are often scared of, but they might hunt, which means they will actively walk in search of a meal or they will do questing behavior. And again, these amblyoma are demonstrating that really nicely here. They climb to the top of a piece of vegetation and wait for a suitable host to pass by. And when the host brushes up against the vegetation, they will very simply um, uh, use their legs to clutch onto the host. They can take quite considerable amounts of blood from their host. Uh, for example, some species can increase in weight by more than 100 times following a blood meal. Here I have a little lineup of ticks um, here, starting with an unfed tick to the right on this top row. And then we um, increase in blood meal size to here where this tick is um, quite engorged, although I have seen some larger um, ticks than this. And also just to demonstrate just how small some of these ticks can be, here we have a nymph and here we have a larva. So when they first attach to you, you might not even notice that they have um, crawled onto you because they're so small. I'm often asked if ticks do any good and I'm not going to answer that question directly, but I will tell you that they can serve as a food source for some animals. Virginia opossums are known to eat thousands of ticks in a single night. And I was surprised to learn that some crabs feed on ticks as well as a lot of other invertebrates like ants and other insects. But there is no evidence that they contribute any significant portion of the diet for any of these animals. They are, however, very good at wild animal population control. As you can see, for example, on this moose, they can aggregate in quite large numbers and really cause, um, they can kill the animal just from exsanguination alone, which is basically, um, taking too much of their blood. And of course, they also transmit pathogens which cause disease in the animals. And the idea is that this is almost like a survival of the fittest idea that the weaker individuals are more likely to succumb to the, either the ticks themselves or the diseases that they've caused. And so you're left with a much stronger um, population of animals. Let's take a little look now at the hard ticks versus the soft ticks. And the name is quite um, telling. They really are hard and soft. So the hard tick has this um, chitinous, which is the same material that beetles have on them. So this kind of hard crunchy material, um, dorsal shield, which is also called a scutum. Whereas this isn't present on the soft tick. The capitulum, which is the mouth parts that are inserted into the host are visible on a hard tick, but not so on the soft tick. And whilst I have this picture here in front of me, I want to draw your attention to where the eyes are, as I think it's quite interesting and maybe not where people expect them to be. I certainly, before I understood more about ticks, thought the, tick, the eyes of the tick would be up here. And interestingly, not all species of tick have eyes. Some do not have any eyes at all. What's more important to them is this Haller's organ, which is in both soft and hard ticks. And it allows them to be able to sense um, temperature changes and changes in carbon dioxide, which might indicate that there is a host nearby. Soft ticks feed very briefly for typically around 30 minutes at a time, normally during the night. They take many blood meals as adults to lay many small batches of eggs. And they often live in nests, dens, caves, and also um, cabins. They carry pathogens that cause disease, as do hard ticks, and incredibly, they can live for over 16 years. Hard ticks, on the other hand, are a little bit different, and from now on, I'm going to be talking just about hard ticks. They hatch from eggs into larvae, and at this stage, they have six legs. Now, they must, at this point, take a blood meal so that they can drop off the host and molt, and then they will emerge as nymphs. Again, um, oh, and I should point out at this um, point, this is just a, um, this blood meal can take a, several days. The, um, there is one nymph stage, whereas for soft ticks, there can be multiple nymph stages. The nymph must also take a blood meal where it will molt into an adult. 
And it's at this stage, the adult stage, that we're able to tell the morphological difference between females and males. Females have a smaller scutum, whereas the, one of the male covers the whole of the back or the abdomen. And that's because the female needs space to take one extra big, large uh, blood meal at the end. So she has sufficient nutrients and energy to lay a single batch of thousands of eggs before she dies. There are different um, ways in which a uh, tick will select a host. So there are some ticks that we call one host ticks. They prefer to feed on a single tick at every point in their life cycle. For example, there is one tick in America that feeds on cows as an um, immature and as an adult. It still drops off in between and molts and then needs to find a new cow to feed on, but it will only ever feed on a cow. There are multi-host ticks, which will feed on different host species at different points in their life. And typically there are species that feed on larger animals such as deer when they're adults. And during the immature phases, they'll um, feed on smaller mammals like mice and rats. Another interesting characteristic of different ticks is whether or not they are nidicolous. So nidicolous comes from the Latin word for nest, and they typically remain in the nest throughout the entire life cycle and are pretty specialist and will feed on a single species. In California, we have a nidicolous tick that is really specialized on feeding on wood rats. And here we have a wood rat nest, which is basically a pile of um, sticks. And the, um, every, the tick will feed on the wood rat. When it's done, it will drop off in the nest and wait to molt and then when it's emerged as it is its next life stage will be ready again to feed on a wood rat when it next enters the nest. non nidicolous ticks are those that are more likely to quest or hunt and as I already explained questing is when the tick climbs to the top of a piece of vegetation and waits for a host to pass by. They typically tend to be more generalist because they're taking advantage of whichever host happens to pass by their vegetation at that time. And these are the ones that we're more likely to encounter. For example, when we're walking on trails and we brush past pieces of grass that might be overhanging the trail. In California, we have around 50 species of tick. Some of them we will just never encounter because they are um, very specious to animals that we're not going to come into contact with. For example, there are some species that feed exclusively on birds, but there are around eight which bite humans. And I'm deliberately being quite vague about the numbers here because um, we keep discovering new species the more we look in nature. And there's also the possibility that new species will be introduced into the state, into the state because of animal and human movements. The California Department of Public Health currently recognizes there being eight tick associated diseases circulating within the state. Perhaps the most well known of which is Lyme disease as well as anaplasmosis and the spotted fever group rickettsioses. And each of the different tick species which bite humans are able to vector different uh, pathogens related to these diseases. For example, Ixtes pacificus is the tick that you're most likely to encounter probably in Northern California. And this is the one that is responsible for vectoring the Lyme disease pathogen. Ripper's syphilis sanguineus is more uh, adapted to hotter environments and so more likely to be seen in Southern California. And this one is more linked to spotted fever group rickettsioses and isn't able to vector Lyme disease. And then we also have Dermacenta, which is a human bite and tick. And so this is just to uh, highlight that each of these ticks are able to vector different pathogens and they look very different and they inhabit very different types of environments. Throughout this presentation, I'm mainly going to be talking about Lyme disease, although I do research on other diseases as well. A little bit of terminology for you. So Lyme disease refers specifically to the illness, what you feel when you're infected. So um, uh, when you feel sick and the pathogen is the thing that actually causes that feeling. And that in this case, it's a Borrelia spirochete bacteria. So spirochete means that it has this curly corkscrew shape appearance and Borrelia is just the genus name of this bacteria. 
I'm not a medical doctor, so I'm not going to go through all of the symptoms of Lyme disease. But what I will say is that they're often nonspecific, meaning it's really hard to distinguish them from, say, a common cold or when you're just feeling run down um, or have the flu because you have headache and fever and malaise. So it can be quite hard to diagnose. And there is a lot of um, people who mistakenly believe that the bullseye rash is the most diagnostic uh, element of the Lyme disease. It's very common. I've read figures between 70 and 90 percent of human cases having this bullseye rash, but it's by all means not in every human case. And it's also really important to acknowledge that this uh, rash can be quite difficult to distinguish on darker skin tones. So how do the ticks get this pathogen in the first place to make us sick? So the pathogen in the case of Lyme disease or Borrelia is ingested with the blood meal. So the tick has to take a blood meal from a host which is already infected. Once the tick has effectively swallowed this pathogen, it will invade the midgut of the, of the tick, then the rest of the body, and then it will finally move into the salivary glands. And this is when the tick is able to infect its next host. The pathogen will be essentially injected into the host at the same time that the tick injects its very well adapted saliva that I talked about previously when feeding on the next host. Let's take a look at what this looks like in the overall cycle of the tick and how that can affect humans. So eggs are nearly always typically laid and hatch in the leaf litter. In the case of Borrelia, it's extremely rare for eggs to be infected. So when the eggs hatch into the larva, the, the larva is also not infected. At this point, one of three things can happen because when the uh, larva needs to take a blood meal, the larva could bite an uninfected host, in which case there's no Borrelia to infect the tick. The larva could bite a, a host which is infected, but it's not what we call a competent host or competent reservoir host. So there is some uh, Borrelia in the host, but it's just not able to infect the tick because um, the host has very good immunity against the, the um, bacteria or just doesn't, the bacteria just doesn't do very well inside that host. Alternatively, the tick could bite an infected reservoir host. And reservoir hosts are those in which the bacteria do really well. And so the host is able to transfer this or transmit this bacteria to the, the tick. And it's at this stage that the tick is infected with Borrelia as well. So the tick will finish its blood meal, drop off and emerge as an infected nymph. This is when we might encounter some issues. If the tick is removed quickly or the human is um, immune, or, um, then there is not enough time for enough Borrelia to be passed to the human and so they don't become sick. However, if the tick is left for a long time, there's a chance that the Borrelia bacteria will be transmitted to the human and the human might become sick. But there are other scenarios as well. The tick might just never bite a human and so although the Lyme disease pathogen will continue to circulate, it will never become an issue for humans because it stays in the wildlife population. Another alternative, which is quite unique to California, is if the infected tick bites a lizard. Lizards in California have a special protein in their blood that kills the pathogen and effectively, cle effectively cleans the infection from the tick. So when the tick drops off the host and molts to the next stage, that tick is no longer infected. And so if it does bite a host, and including a human, it's unlikely to transmit any Borrelia. And I just like to point out at this stage, although I showed that the larva becoming infected, it could also happen at the nymph or the adult stage too. So there was obviously a lot going on there. So I'm just gonna recap quickly the different potential cycles of Borrelia in humans to highlight that just because you get bitten by a tick, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's infected and nor does it mean that an infected tick is going to make you sick. So ticks may never become infected with any pathogen because it just doesn't happen to bite a host which was infected in the first place. The tick might get infected and bite a human and cause us to become sick. 
or it may not make us sick because we managed to remove it in time or because um, we are immune. An infected tick just may never bite a human and stay inside the wildlife uh, population. So the Borrelia still cycles in there and, and is, um, but it doesn't infect humans in any way. Or an infected tick might get cleared of infection if it takes a blood meal from a lizard. Now, there is another layer of complexity in all this. We thought until quite recently that we had good handle on how Borrelia was cycling in the different ecosystems. But thanks to more um, advances in molecular methods, we've actually found that what we first thought was a single species, Borrelia burgdorferi, is actually many different species. So now we call them Borrelia burgdorferi sensu latu. And this is basically an umbrella term to include all of the Borrelias that we used to think was one species, but is actually different species. And you can see that there is some genetic differences between them, but overall they're quite, they're certainly morphologically very similar and they're um, genetically pretty similar as well. I'm also including Borrelia miyamotoi here. That's a very different species altogether and is not under this umbrella. This is the pathogen which causes uh, tick-borne relapsing fever. So if we've gone all this time not knowing what all of these different genome species um, were and we thought they were all one species and, and they're so genetically similar, why do we suddenly care that they are different and giving them different names? Well, the reason is that they actually are different in how they, it, whether or not they can cause disease in humans. So we, what we thought was um, Borrelia causing disease before in nature, actually a lot of them don't actually cause disease in humans. And the only species that we know for sure in California causes disease is the Borrelia burgdorferi sensu stricto. I've highlighted Borrelia bizetii in gray here because in Europe it does seem to cause disease, but as yet we haven't seen any evidence that it does so in America. So let's go back a step and consider now that we have different hosts with different capabilities of being a good host for Borrelia. And we also have different genome species of Borrelia. Now I'm going to use squirrels and wood rats as um, different examples here. Squirrels are really good hosts of Borrelia. They're very competent reservoir hosts. The pathogen can um, dupe, uh, it can duplicate very well inside this host and uh, ticks that feed on infected squirrels get infected very easily. When we look specifically at what Borrelia's squirrels often tend to be infected with, we find that these are the ones that do cause disease in humans. So squirrels, particularly gray squirrels, specifically in California, are really important in the pathogen cycle of Borrelia. Wood rats are also pretty good hosts of Borrelia. Again, they are pretty good at allowing um, ticks that feed on them to become infected by Borrelia. But when we look at what uh, Borrelia genome species they happen to be infected with, they are actually often infected with ones that do not cause disease. So that's kind of um, a good news for us. So if I see that there are a lot of infected wood rats in an area, without knowing what genome species they're infected with, that's much less of a concern if, than if I see that there is a lot of infected squirrels, because the chances are, although they're infected, the Borrelia isn't going to cause us any disease. So my research basically tries to make sense of what species of tick are feeding on what species of host and whether or not they're infected with different pathogens and that can cause disease or not. I try to understand how Borrelia cycles in nature and how and why these cycles might change, for example, over time due to different seasons or more dramatic events, for example, wildfire. And I'm interested in what that means for risks to humans. For example, if I find that there is a lot of Borrelia in ticks that do not ever bite humans, that's much less of a concern than if it, I find that there is a lot of Borrelia in ticks that do bite on humans. I perform my research by doing uh, experiment or uh, performing um, observations in the field and in the lab. I collect ticks by performing tick flagging, which takes advantage of the questing behavior of ticks 
and you basically take a white piece of cloth which is lightly dragged over the vegetation and any ticks that might be questing should latch onto it and then I can collect them from the piece of cloth. I also collect ticks as well as other samples such as a small piece of tissue from humanely collected mammal hosts in the environment over time. And I'm really careful to um, take good care and not to hurt these animals, obviously for ethical reasons, but also because I'm really interested to see how infection and number of ticks changes over time. And I do that by giving each individual that I capture a little individually numbered ear tag so that I can track them over time. So I just want to share with you now a quick video that was filmed by Hannah Bird at Hopland Research and Extension Centre, which is on central Pomo land. Um, and this will give you some idea, more idea of what I do in the field specifically. Hello, I'm Emily Pasco and, a po and I'm a postdoctoral researcher at the University of California, Davis. And I study the ecology of ticks and tick-borne pathogens. And one of the ways that I do that is to check the um, small mammals in this area for ticks and to test them like, to see if they have any, I test both the animal and the ticks for the pathogens, um, including the Lyme disease uh, bacteria. So I have a trap over here that I happen to know has a mouse in it, so I'm just going to quickly show you what that process involves. Thanks, Emily. <laughs> And Emily, the area that we're in right now was burned, am I correct in saying that? Yes, yeah, so in 2018, the river fire um, very badly burnt this area. So as you can see uh, now, it's basically bare ground um, with rocks and um, a small amount of leaf litter. But prior to the fire, there was really um, a, a good layer of leaf litter, and that was particularly good habitat for the ticks and also the small mammals. Now that that's gone, we're trying to understand if that's had any negative effect on the ticks or the animals. Um, and we're still in the process of data collection, but um, we will maybe see that, that it has affected them. This is a Sherman trap, so it's particularly good for small mammals um, like mice. Here I have um, a tomahawk, and that's more for the squirrels, as you can see the mice could easily get through those um, gaps. And both of these are live traps? Yes, so we don't hurt the animals in any way. We want to release them and we want to um, keep track of who's who, who's had ticks, who hasn't had ticks and who's been infected. Um, so we're very careful with them and we don't want to cause them any harm. I would normally um, weigh the animal, I would sex it and I would um, decide what species it is based on different characteristics, but I know that this one has already been caught before this week, uh -huh. um, so I'm not going to do that today. And I know that because, and it's a male by the way, it's got a little ear tag, oh, yeah, we can own see. individual number on it, so I know his history. <laughs> um, but since I have him in my hand, I'm just going to give a quick check for ticks. They tend to hang out in areas that are harder to groom, like the ears, sometimes also between the fingers and the tail. And at this point, I would also maybe take some samples from him to, to test to see if he has any pathogens, and then I will release him. Excellent. Should I let him go? It sounds good to me. Thank you so much. He's going back where you found him, right? Yeah. Oh, how lovely. Oh. <laughs> so once I have all of these samples, I then need to check in the lab if they are infected or not. So I test ticks and samples um, from animals for tick-borne pathogens that cause disease. I perform tick identification to understand if the ticks I collected are those that are likely to bite humans or not. I perform PCR, which is a way of checking the DNA specifically for DNA from um, tick-borne pathogens. And then I perform sequencing. So if there were any pathogens, I can check to see which genome species they were and understand if they are the ones that cause disease in humans or not. 
So just hopping back to thinking about that video, that was in relation to the 2018 Mendocino complex fire. And one of the fires that was part of that complex was the river fire that burned around 198 kilometers squared of land, mainly Pomo land. And that included large swaths of the Hopland Research and Extent Extension Center, which is where that video was filmed. Now, I was really lucky to be able to have access to pre-fire data on the ticks and animals there, thanks to Professor Bob Lane at UC Berkeley, allowing me to be able to understand the effect that the fire had on the ticks and animals. The fire was quite extensive in size and the severity was also quite severe. So it was in the Mendocino um, County and this scale bar here helps us to understand how large the fire was. This is a raw satellite image that was taken from space um, of the burned area. And just to give you some orientation, I believe this is part of Clear Lake here. And then the USGS was able to tell from this satellite image how severe the burn was. And as you can see, there are large areas of um, yellow and red areas, which indicate that there was moderate to high burning severity there. Looking specifically at Hopland, you can see the boundaries here uh, indicated in black with the internal fences inside. Almost, well, more than half of the area was quite badly burned, including some very high severity burns. In, and the area that I was researching is um, around this area here. So that did burn particularly severely. The image I showed you earlier of the flagging gives an indication of the type of habitat that's at Hopland. It's not in the same area, but it's all very similar in terms of the fact that there was a lot of grassland before the fire, very diverse oak trees, and then also some chaparral. And you can see that after the fire, um, things changed drastically. And this picture was taken a few weeks after the fire had been extinguished at Hopland. I believe it was still burning elsewhere. So that's why you can see the, um, there's a lot of smoke in the atmosphere. But you can also see that there's no grass left at all. We are looking at bare ground here. And this white patch here would have previously have been a tree, but it was completely combusted into ash. So unfortunately, that was all a little bit of a teaser because uh, Professor Lane and I are still analyzing that data. We understand that there is a lot of um, misinformation and uh, you know, scare, scare tactics used in Lyme disease. And we don't want to contribute to that in any way. We want to make sure that we really understand what our data are showing before we share anything. And then as soon as we know, we will make that publicly available. But in the meantime, I can share with you data from a similar study that was conducted at the Cold Canyon University of California Reserve, which was near Lake Berryessa on Patwin land. And that was burned in 2015 by the RAG fire. So um, here we can see some um, areas of the Lake Berryessa. This was my control site, which was um, really useful to have as a comparison to the burned area. So um, this, this is Quail Ridge, and then the burned area is Cold Canyon. And you can see, again, this was a very um, moderate to high burning fire. And to orientate you, um, we're looking at the sort of Sac Yolo um, area, here, sorry, the Yolo area here. To give you an idea of what the place was like beforehand, there were a lot of wood rats and um, the area was extensively studied by members of the lab I'm in at the moment before the fire because it has so many wood rats and they are um, really good hosts for ticks as we can see here as well as for different Borrelias. And one thing that I wanted to draw your attention to was the uh, habitat that they like to live in, which is where there is a lot of um, shrubs and bushes and trees because they build these um, huge middens sometimes. Uh, middens is, or nests are made of very neatly arranged piles of sticks, which are divided into chambers within which the wood rat will um, feed in one, store food in another and sleep in another. Now looking at what the place looked like after the fire. So here we can see a slope that was burned and the surrounding area wasn't burned, um, which gives a nice indication of what the habitat was like before the fire. So quite similar in some ways to Hopland, you have a lot of grassland, um, chaparral and oak trees. 
plenty of the types of vegetation that wood rats really like to be able to build those middens. The fire was quite extensive and it was also quite severe. So here you can see that um, any uh, litter on the ground, so leaves and sticks and grass was completely burned, leaving behind very bare ground. And this was previously a wood rat midden that the team knew beforehand from their previous trapping. And what was left behind was a very pitiful little pile of sticks. So what did we find in this study? Well, obviously from the pictures I've just shown you, there was dramatic changes in vegetation cover, but we wanted to be able to quantify that so that we could do some analyses. So this is where satellite images come in really useful. This is an image that was taken from, a, from space from a satellite orbiting Earth. And I was able to use this to calculate the measure of greenness within that image. And this basically can be used as a proxy for the vegetation cover. And um, I found that after, when analyzing the uh, data across um, different seasons and um, different years following and before and after the fire, there was a 16 fold difference in um, vegetation cover pre versus post fire at Cold Canyon when we compared the same calculations at the Quail Ridge control site. I also found that there were 5.5 times more rodents after the fire at Cold Canyon, which initially sounded kind of strange. Since the fire was so severe, I expected that many animals would have perished and that there would not have been very much food or habitat left after the fire for, for animals to do so well. But when we looked a little bit more carefully at this data, we found that although there was an increase in animals, there was a loss of important reservoir hosts. So um, the wood rats uh, decreased drastically after the fire, but there were many more mice because they have really fast life histories. They have a lot of babies um, throughout the year and they're really well adapted to surviving in um, heavily modified environments. So um, in this graph here, we can see the difference between our burned site and our controlled site, where the closer uh, numbers are to the, this zero line here, the more similar the communities were. So we can see before the fire, which happened in summer 2015, at our Cold Canyon site, which burned, um, there were quite a few more wood rats there compared to our control sites. After the fire, there were fewer wood rats immediately thereafter, and then they very slowly started to recover. When we look at the same data for deer mice, we see that there is a very dramatic um, difference and in terms of the fact that there were much, much higher numbers of deer mice at the burned site compared to the non-burned sites. We found that there were fewer ticks on animals at the burned site compared to the control site. So we're talking 14% versus almost 50%. And I really like these two graphs because they give a really good indication of why it's so important to have a control site if you're able to have one. Because if you look at these numbers in, as an absolute term, it looks like the number of ticks, um, the, num the proportion of animals infested with ticks was actually higher post fire which is true. But when we compare it to a control site, we see that actually the difference um, shows that the, there were, were way fewer ticks on animals compared to the control site. And the, the likelihood of that is, uh, is likely that this was just changes in seasonality that we managed to pick up. There was also um, a drought that occurred between um, 2015 and 2017, which might also have accounted for this particularly high um, prevalence on animals, but having that control site allowed us to make that comparison and see that there um, was a relative decrease in uh, tick infestation. So obviously the fact that there were many wood rats perished in the fire was very sad, but it was really nice to see from our camera traps that some individuals did survive um, the fire. Now I want to talk to you a little bit about other research that I've been doing. As I said, I'm not just interested in dramatic changes like wildfires, but also on seasonality and changes that occur over time. So I found from my collections and testing samples 
that ticks collected in spring and summer are more likely to be infected than ticks collected in fall or winter. I also found that ticks from wood rats were more likely to be infected than ticks from mice, which is very, um, is what I would have expected for California. If we were on the East Coast, however, I would not have expected that because on the East Coast, in the New York area particularly, um, mice are actually very good reservoir hosts, and so I would not have seen that pattern there. I also saw that there was a higher prevalence of Borrelia We've lost your your sound, Emily. We've lost maybe lost you altogether. I uh, don't see your video either. Emily, can you hear me? Uh, we still see your screen. So Emily, I think it looks like Emily's going to go out and come back in again, and we hope we can restore her visibility. There, she's back. Sorry about that. Are you able to hear me now? Yes. Okay, good. I apologize for that. Um, so uh, did you all hear about this slide? I'm going to assume that everyone heard everything. No, we didn't get, we were there. That's where we were, it was right there. Okay, great. So I think I finished this slide and I'm going to go on to the next slide now. Um, so all of that information that I've been able to gather from this research helps us to better understand how Borrelia cycles um, in nature and what ticks are feeding on what hosts and how that affects the cycle. And this can help us to inform how we perform tick and pathogen control. So we know which host species to target, which ticks to target and so on. But unfortunately, there isn't a great deal of tick and pathogen control that we can do at the moment. What we, what the options that are normally available to us at the moment in, involve um, in, enticing an animal that's likely to be a host, like a mouse or a deer to an area with some um, food or bait and then causing have, making them be painted uh, basically by an acaricide. So acaricides are um, chemicals that kill ticks. So in this case, the mouse is encouraged to enter this area to get this food. And in doing so, it passes through this little doorway, which is infused with acaricide. The uh, mouse gets covered in the acaricide and then it goes away and the, the ticks will drop off and die. And it's a very similar um, concept here for the deer where we have the deer encouraged to eat from this trough here. And in doing so, it rubs its neck up against these um, paint roll, literally paint rollers that are also infused with acaricide um, and cause the ticks to die. So the best way actually of um, performing any kind of tick and pathogen control is just um, personal protection. So always protect yourself. And I know that I said that the ticks found in fall and winter are less likely to be infected than those in spring and summer. I want to kind of highlight that that's just very specific to the study areas that I've been looking at. And these ecosystems change depending on the habitat and the climate, whether you're on the east coast or the west coast. And just because I found fewer ticks that were infected in fall and winter, it doesn't mean that they aren't there. So even if you think the risk is low, always protect yourself. And there are ways that we can, multiple ways in which you can do that. And I like to think of them in um, ways that we can minimize where ticks can bite. So covering our skin by wearing um, long trousers and long sleeves and tucking in our um, trousers into our socks. Minimizing how ticks can bite. So um, spraying our clothes with DEET, which is a repellent and staying on paths and trails. So avoiding that vegetation that the ticks might be questing on so that they can't um, clutch hold of you. And then always check for ticks. So if you know you're going in a particularly ticky environment, 
I always try to wear light colored clothing because that allows me to check myself regularly and see them more easily before they have a chance to bite me in the first place. So I check, you know, every 30 minutes my legs to see if there are any ticks crawling up them. And then as soon as I am in a place to be able to do so, I take a warm shower and check all over my body for ticks. They prefer to hide out in all the places that are difficult to see, so under the armpits and in the groin area. And then I put my clothes in a hot dryer for 15 minutes um, minimum. It looks like putting them in the washing machine doesn't get rid of hitchhikers, so the hot dryer is what we really want to do after that. And then finally, there is a lot of information out there that is uh, really useful in telling us how to, else to protect ourselves and other risks to look out for, so other diseases that the um, ticks can cause. I particularly like this one because it reminds us that we should also protect our animals, uh, our pets, so cats and dogs, so that they don't get sick, but also so they don't bring ticks into the household that they might also bite us. And it also tells us what to do if we happen to get bitten by a tick. Again, like I've hopefully already um, let you know, getting bitten by a tick doesn't mean you're going to get sick. And then I really encourage you, if you're concerned about ticks, to check out the CDC and the CDPH websites. Yeah, because they have a lot of other information in there that's very good. I sent that to everybody in an email yesterday. Those, Brilliant, thank you. Those links for you. So I hope I have convinced you that um, Ticks are, are very interesting and they are not always going to be able to cause disease in us, but um, we should always protect ourselves anyway. So please don't let ticks stop you enjoying the outdoors. And yeah, I'm happy to answer questions or chat with anybody now. Great. Thank you, Emily, so much. There was packed, just tons of information in there. We have lots and lots of questions. So I'm just gonna take the first one first, uh, which was asked about, do the ticks sense the CO2 from your breath when they're questing? Yes, so the, um, the Haller's organ, which is on the first pair of legs, um, has special sensory um, hairs, basically, that are able to detect um, CO2, as well as temperature. So um, you often see them actually sometimes when they're questing with their arms up, which um, I assume is them kind of sensing their environment to see if there is a host passing by. It also allows them also to easily latch on because they're, they're ready. Uh, one question was, do all California lizards possess the capability of cleaning the tick of infection? I am not familiar with all of the species of lizard in California, but I do know that the western fence lizard and the alligator lizard both do have that property. Um, more so the western fence lizard um, and the other species I'm not sure have been tested to my knowledge. Hmm. Uh, do dog ticks transmit lines? To my knowledge, they do not. They are more likely to transmit tularemia or rickettsiosis. Um, I don't think that they are able to uh, transmit Lyme. Uh, how, how frequently do you recapture tagged mice? Oh, um, very frequently. More so the larger um, mammals, so the wood rats and the chipmunks. I can, I've been um, trapping for almost two years and I will consistently capture the same um, individuals over many months. The smaller mice um, tend to have a much faster life history and they tend to migrate more and move around more. So I will recapture them for a few months and then um, sometimes they will go away and I will never see them again. And sometimes they will surprise me and will pop back again in six months time. So it's very common for me to recapture the same individual. Uh, Julie says there have been tick and lizard research in, involving the Osborne Preserve that Sonoma State owns. Have you conducted any research there? And are you familiar with any tick research that's been there? And if so, would you share what you've learned? You know? No, unfortunately, I haven't. I'm, um, I have no collaboration with that. Well, maybe you can now. <laughs> uh, Julie, uh, do you know anything about the research that you referenced? I am um, looking for the research paper that involves the tick lizard research at Osborne Preserve. I'm looking at my files right now. So okay. I'll share it with uh, you, Margo, when okay. I find I can share it. Okay, I'll share with everybody else, great. Uh, 
So Emily, did you design this research or are you carrying on the work of previous researchers? A combination of the two. So the work that I am doing um, or have done with the fires um, has been in close collaboration with people who by chance were already collecting data at those sites before the fire. Um, I also collaborated very heavily with a master's student, um, Ben Flaud, on the Coal Canyon data um, for, for the fire study there. And then with respect to the other studies which are more looking at um, changes over time or season or other less dramatic events, that is more um, work that I did independently. And uh, what is the fire related hypothesis that's relating to ticks? Julie thought you might've mentioned it and she might've missed it, but. Yeah, no, um, so I think, it, it seems to depend very heavily on how severe the burn was. Um, it's certainly um, pre-colonization time, native peoples used fire to rid their land, like rid camping areas that they were um, staying in of ticks. And it seems to be effective to some extent, but there is also other research that when, um, less intense fires have burned an area, ticks survive quite well. There was one study by Kerry Paget, who is at the California Department of Public Health. She actually buried small packages of ticks um, that were in little paper packages under the ground um, before a prescribed burn and they actually survived quite well after that. And um, so there's quite mixed evidence and I think it really depends on how severe and how intensely the fire burned, um, what, what hosts were there before the fire, what species of tick there were, um, if it was a very grassy area versus uh, a, a wooded area. Um, for example, the two places that I studied were very grassy, so the the, the area of, on the ground was completely destroyed and, and all of the habitat there, whereas I imagine that in a more wooded area there is enough um, the trees are, are better able to survive the fire and to give refuge areas for the ticks and the hosts. Daniel asks, are some humans naturally immune to the Borrelia infection or is it due to vaccination? I don't know about natural immunity. I It looks like if you've been infected or exposed before that you can have some immunity for some years thereafter. Um, there was a vaccine that was being developed, but unfortunately uh, that never came to fruitation. Um, I think maybe it was perhaps not as effective as people had hoped or um, that I think maybe there was also some controversy, controversy about the, the cost that it was to produce it. Um, that was something that was started, but unfortunately never came to fruitation. Do you have any thoughts about controlling ticks and household pets as a way to control the tick populations near your home? I think that uh, treating pets is uh, really important and um, particularly pets that, and I mean, for the pet themselves, but also for any ticks that they might bring into the house. Unfortunately, I think that there are um, so many other hosts around the home, like mice and rats and squirrels, um, particularly thinking about what I see on a daily basis in Davis, that um, it's not going to cause, by treating your pet, you're not going to have any significant impact on the tick uh, numbers in your general area. We do have a few more questions, but I need to say just a few words before we close at three. And then, uh, as I mentioned at the top of the program, Emily, we'll stay around and ask answer a few more. And we, you can turn your mics on and ask her in person if you have other questions for her. But I wanted to thank you all so very much for attending today. And I hope you've learned a lot. I certainly feel like I have, and I'm more comfortable now when I'm out there fighting against these critters. Um, and as I've said before, this is the 15th in a series of 20 virtual events that the center has planned through December. So check them all out at our cei.sonoma.ed slash calendar and register for those that interest you. And there are a few that I would like to point to specifically. We have two more in November. On November 14th, we will be talking with Jutta Berger, who was the science program director at the California Invasive Plant Council. 
And she's going to be looking at invasive plants as well as management techniques and tools. On the 21st, we will be exploring the world of lichen. Then in December, we have an unusual photography pro program on assistive technology that can help people with limited access get into the field and enjoy the world of, of photography. And our last event of the fall will be a winter writing walk during which SSU's former English department lecturer, Lakin Khan, is gonna share some tips about how to breathe life into your own nature writing. So I wanna thank you all for joining us. Stay safe, hope to see you again at another program soon and stick around for a little bit longer if you have questions. And again, I turn on your mics and Emily will, will stay here to answer your questions for a little while. Thank you all. Okay, so you can all, assuming you can unmute. See some of you, are, some of you are. A uh, couple of other questions, Emily, that were in the chat. Let me get in there. Can I ask a question? Go ahead. I wanted to ask Emily if she knows how long after a West Black legged tick is pulled out of a body, a person, and saved, can it be tested for possible human infections? Yeah, that's a good question, and it depends very much on how you store it. Um, when I'm in the field, I collect them in 70% uh, ethanol, and that allows me to be able to test them some quite some months afterwards in the field uh, from after collecting them in the field. Um, of course, the average person probably doesn't have access to those kind of chemicals to be able to store them. But if you if you're a concerned yourself, you can save it um, either in a little container or on a piece of uh, tape, for example, sticky tape so that it can't crawl away and saving it in the fridge or the freezer should be able to keep it in good enough condition, probably for a week or so. Um, and at least enough time for you to understand if you are displaying any symptoms um, and you want to get that tick tested. Okay, because the reason I asked is because I did get infected and I had a bullseye and I had to go through a lot of treatment, but mm -hmm. I guess I get concerned whether or not I have some lingering things that haven't showed up. I'm still learning a lot about what might possibly happen. And I did save the tick, but I can't remember exactly how I saved it. It's in a little Ziploc bag and it was identified, but never tested. Yeah, I mean, there's there's no harm in um, taking it to somebody, uh, to a medical practitioner who can either test it for you or send you in the right direction for someone who's able to test it medically and um, see if they're able to still try and get some DNA out of that. Um, DNA is interesting stuff. It, sometimes it can hang around longer than you expect. So it's always worth a try. Yeah, thank you for letting me know the question to ask. So ask for DNA testing. Thank you. Yes, yeah. Interesting question here. I don't know whether Paula is still here, but her question was, is the compound in the lizard's blood being investigated to help eradicate Borrelia? And also the substance in ticks blood that toughens and numbs the host Skin, is that being researched? Um, with respect to the first question, actually the answer to both those questions, I'm not entirely sure. I think that the, um, yeah, I don't know the answer, unfortunately. Do to my you... knowledge, um, certainly not the, unlikely the lizard blood, but I do believe that there is some research going on into the tick saliva um, because there are so many interesting compounds in that that um, could help us out with the problem of ticks. But yeah, I'm sorry, I can't give you more information there. Okay. Uh, Peter asks, how long does an infected tick need to feed on a person in order to infect that person? That depends very much on the pathogen and therefore like the disease it is going to cause. 
Um, for some pathogens, uh, for example, tick-borne encephalitis, which I don't think is in America, but is certainly in Europe, it's a matter of minutes to hours. With Borrelia, the Lyme disease pathogen, it can be um, much longer than that. So um, I think maybe 12, eight or 12 hours, something like that. So a number of hours. So you certainly have time to get it. But those are obviously just averages. I don't think there is any set in stone amount of time. So um, the quicker you get it off, the better, basically. Those, I think, were the questions pretty much. Oh, somebody put in the chat the, uh, Fair, the Fairfield Osborne research. Oh, great. If anyone's interested in looking at that. Uh, I have a I have a question about what are the symptoms a squirrel might exhibit if they had Lyme disease? Do they have the same symptoms that humans have or what? No, so it seems like to the best of our knowledge, um, squirrels show no symptoms at all. They're quite, and, and that's one reason why they're such good reservoir hosts because um, the, yeah, the pathogen just seems to do incredibly well in them and doesn't cause any illness. They can still live for a long time and um, they don't suffer. So um, giving ticks plenty of opportunity to keep feeding on them and spread the pathogen. Wow, thank you. Uh, Carrie answered that question, Carrie, uh, which in most cases, the tick must be attached for 36 to 48 hours or more before the Lyme disease bacterium can be transmitted that she got from the uh, I think from the CDC site that you suggested we look at it and like okay yeah so that's 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 reassuring yes you have a window of opportunity right exactly so, so what you're saying then you don't think the wildlife that gets bitten has it is impacted doesn't get the uh, the Lyme disease or the disease that the pathogen carries no, with respect to Borrelia and Lyme disease, no, there are some other um, tick associated diseases that do make um, wildlife sick. Um, but with respect to Borrelia, they don't seem to show any um, bad, any illness or, or, or bad effect. At least the species that I study in, in California. Emily. Uh, yeah, sorry, I should just also note that, for example, other animals like um, dogs do, uh, I believe dogs can get arthritis and, uh, and other symptoms from Lyme disease. So I'm, I was talking specifically about the wildlife there. So another reason to test or to treat your animals for ticks. Emily, I wondered if you had ever heard of uh, setting out some dry ice on a white sheet as a, a, a way to help lure ticks when you're trying to collect them. Yes, yes. That, um, some of my colleagues have done that. So that's particularly good for the hunting ticks. So those are the ticks that are very actively um, walking around looking for a host. I have found it to be less successful than the flagging specifically for the questing ticks, which are the ones that I'm interested in. But you're mm -hmm. right that it's, um, so the, you, for people who maybe aren't familiar, you put some dry ice um, on a, a white flag and the dry ice releases carbon dioxide, which obviously the ticks can sense from their Haller's organ and they'll walk towards the source. Um, so yeah, for the hunting ticks, it's very good. And also for soft ticks, I've heard that it um, can be good as well. Thank you. Somebody who goes by the name of E said that he didn't hear the part about the role that trees play. I think that was when, when your system crashed a little bit. So maybe you could just repeat that part. Oh, yes, sorry about that. So yeah, um, the habitat is important because it very much influences what hosts are going to be in that area. So um, I believe that the reason I saw more infected ticks in forested and wooded areas is because that's the kind of habitat that the important reservoir hosts prefer. So the squirrels utilize that habitat a lot as do the wood rats because um, that's where their food sources are. They make their nests either up in the trees or use the sticks to make um, their nests. Um, whereas the grassy areas um, I saw fewer infected ticks probably because that's where um, 
there are less likely to be wood rats and squirrels and other important reservoir hosts because there just isn't the materials or resources there that they like. One thing that, that I've noticed that I always find the ticks on the back of my neck. And if they're coming up from the grass, I don't understand how they get there so quickly. They are surprisingly active. They are very fast and um, they are very good at um, making the most of the, the dark areas, so like our groins and armpits and the dark areas. And um, yeah, they're impressive how stealthy they can be. Do you have any parting words, Emily, that you would like to share with everybody? No, it's just, um, I'd like to say it was really a pleasure to talk with you all and I hope that you found it interesting and also reassuring and helpful to learn a little bit more about them. Thank you, Emily Pasco, very, very much for your wealth of information shared with us. And thank you all of you out there who came and, and participated with your great questions. And we hope to see you at our next Zoom event. Thank you all.